Welcome to this week's Days of Common Learning. It's a great one we can take time from our typical schedule and dive deep into a subject that's of critical importance for our life today and for our future. As we think about the future of work, especially in this time of global pandemic, a socio-political disruption that we face, and, and certainly the, the rapid movement and advancement of technology, there's no more relevant conversation than the ones that we're gonna have this week. And this is certainly relevant for our students. The Bureau of Labor Statistics says that you're gonna have 12 jobs by the time you're 50 years old. We would be doing you a disservice if we prepared you, prepared you for a job. We wanna prepare you for your seventh job, your eighth job, your ninth job. We wanna prepare you for jobs that don't exist using information that is yet to be discovered. And that's the beauty of a liberal arts education as we explore across the disciplines and learn how to learn, how to think critically and analytically, how to see problems and think creatively of how to address them and solve them for a better world. And one of the great things that we can do here at SPU is bring a lens of faith into this conversation as we think about the future of work, what those systems will be, the organizations, the culture, that you will help lead and you will help create. We can do so with an eye toward equity, toward justice, toward restoring the world and creating a world as God intended it to be. But one of the things I love to say about SPU is that we're large enough for quality and small enough for community. And when you think about quality and you look at the slate of speakers that will join us this week, these will be experts in this field, bringing unique insights into our conversations and certainly begins with Andrew Yang, former bright, uh, presidential candidate. But yet we're here at SPU and we're small enough for community where we can have these conversations in person and together, whether it's remote or in person or a hybrid fashion, where we can engage in a conversation about the future of work. Well, I pray that you engage in this experience this week and that you are fulfilled and that you find it relevant for your life and for your future. God bless. Thank you for joining us for our 2020 Days of Common Learning. This year, we are exploring the future of work in the age of a pandemic, socio-political disruption, and rapid technological change. This week, we explored a variety of topics we spoke about accelerated digital transformation and the impact on our lives. We spoke about theology and the future of work. We addressed jobs. And we also spoke about the impact of socio-political disruption on diverse populations. We're excited that our keynote speaker for this event is Andrew Yang. Hello, Seattle Pacific University. It's a pleasure to be here on this big day of common learning to talk about something I'm very passionate about, and that's the future of work. Now, I ran for president uh, in 2020. Uh, that's how you've probably seen me. Uh, hopefully you were uh, glued into these television debates and you saw me talking about some of the massive concerns that are coming down the pike around the automation of our labor. Uh, and unfortunately, that trend is now accelerating because of the coronavirus pandemic um, that has completely transformed our way of life. Seattle was one of the earliest parts of the country that was hit by the pandemic. Now, the concerns I had in 2018, 2019, 2020, though they're, they're here with us right now, they were actually building up for years and years. And so what I would try to convey to folks on the trail uh, was that we're seeing these changes around us all the time and that they're affecting millions of Americans every single day. You know, you're studying, uh, you're, we're here together in part because we wanna learn, we wanna grow. Uh, but even being in a college setting actually is a rare privilege uh, throughout the country where only about a third of Americans will graduate from college. And so if you look at the workforce, what do Americans do for a living? If you have a majority of your country, clear majority that uh, consists of high school graduates, what are the jobs? And so the jobs that define our economy 
uh, are the things you think of. And I want you to just take a moment to actually try and think, like, what do people do? Like, maybe not people who, uh, who graduate from college. And so the biggest job categories in our country are being transformed in real time right now. They are administrative and clerical work, which includes call center workers, sales and retail, many of them considered essential workers right now, but you also have 30% of stores and malls that are closing for good, in part because of your corporate neighbor, Amazon, sucking up $20 billion in business every year. Food service and food preparation, you're seeing more robot burger flippers uh, in some of these fast food locations, in part because it saves money, but in part because it may um, reduce the odds of uh, coronavirus spread. Truck driving and transportation. Being a trucker is the most common job in 29 states in the U.S. There are 3 million truckers plus. And then an additional more than 7 million Americans who work at truck stops, motels, and diners that serve the truckers. And then the fifth employment category is manufacturing. Uh, now, that might surprise you that it's that high, but it is. And so these five job categories, administrative and clerical, sales and retail, food service and food prep, tra truck driving and transportation and manufacturing comprise about half of all American jobs. Half of all American jobs. And this is what I was concerned about running for president, where I said, look, even without knowing that this pandemic was around the corner, our malls and stores are closing. You don't think of that as an automation story because it's not like when you go into the mall, there's like a robot behind the storefront uh, to sell you things. But the reason why that mall is faltering and closing is because of Amazon and Amazon's fulfillment centers and warehouses are filled with workers as far as the eye can see. When you make a phone call into that call center, sometimes you're getting a bot or software, sometimes you get a human. Over time, the software will become so good that you might not even be able to tell it's not a person. Uh, and that's going to be very negative for the 2 million plus Americans who work in call centers right now, making on average $14 an hour. Self-driving cars and trucks are where the rubber hits the road. Uh, and the Obama White House projected several million drivers would be impacted by this over time. Uh, if you look at the economics around having trucks that can drive themselves, the cost savings are literally in the tens of billions of dollars a year. Uh, it's one reason why so many technology companies are trying to solve that problem. You could also argue that if they do solve that problem, it would save lives because you'd have fewer car accidents that might lower the environmental impact of these vehicles. These trends I'm describing that you're seeing right now speed up because of the pandemic uh, will define the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, and we are way, way, way behind on trying to figure out what that's going to mean for us. You know, on, on the college level too, um, the reality is that we have not been adapting our educational systems and institutions over the last number of years and decades either. Now, I'm an entrepreneur um, as well as a presidential candidate. And one of the things that I see that happened is that we respond to the incentives in our marketplace, where if you were a college and you did things a certain way, uh, then there's no real reason to change, frankly. And this is true not just at the college level, you can look at the high school level, um, that there's a real frustration that we have been kind of stuck in the 20th century in terms of uh, preparing people for an industrial economy that may or may not even exist anymore. And you all are at the cusp right now because you're going to be studying and graduating at a point when the economy is undergoing this massive transformation. So I have some good news, which is that you'd much rather be in your shoes uh, than someone who, let's say, is like a 52-year-old truck driver, and then, like, let's say the, um, that, that job becomes less central to the economy over time. Whereas for you, you're equipping yourselves with all these skills and learnings, and then you're going to be going out into a transforming world, yes, but you're going to yourselves be much better prepared than most, and you'll be at a period where you can actually be directed and trained toward things that are gonna become more relevant, not less relevant. Uh, so what does that look like? Because we're talking about the future of work. So everything I've laid out about how many of the most common jobs are going to start uh, losing um, frequency, uh, and some of the, the trends also will affect 
jobs that are white collar. Um, I was an attorney for a little while. And the fact is that AI and software can do a lot of legal work that you used to need people pouring over contracts. And, and sometimes the software can actually do that much more quickly and accurately. So you have these fundamental transformations going on with the fourth industrial revolution that will touch and even transform many parts of the economy. So then what does the future hold? And this is where the incentives come in, is that, uh, that, that the, the reality is that our economy, and this is something that I actually find frustrating when I talk to folks about the future of work, here's like an argument that you probably heard, and you know I, I'm going to present it, is that, uh, well, okay, certain forms of work are going to fall by the wayside, a lot of, let's call it manual repetitive work, um, and so we're gonna replace that with the caring economy with a hum human empathetic uh, type of opportunities um, because robots won't do them as well and uh, we're gonna have more of a need and this is what people will naturally gravitate towards. And uh, in a way that's a very appealing narrative and makes sense, like what could be wrong with that? The problem right now is that just because you eliminate the rewards associated with certain forms of work does not mean all of a sudden that there's an immense new uh, set of resources for educating our kids, providing each other mental health resources, taking care of our aging loved ones, like all the things that you think, okay, there'll be this massive set of needs. There are those needs right now, but there are not the economic resources in place to actually activate those opportunities. Like if you want to go out and become a mental health worker, tomorrow, it's not like all of a sudden that's 10 times easier um, because we have these needs and these other opportunities are starting to recede. Like the, there's not more money in it necessarily. Like the costs are still the same. The opportunities are still the same. So this is really what we have to try and rebalance and change. We have to make it so that there actually are more resources available for what you think of as these human centered pursuits and jobs of the future. Uh, and so as a young person, you're in a bit of a bind, honestly, because when you look up, you say, okay, I get that some of these jobs are starting to go away. There are certain jobs that you're going to need more of. Uh, and so if you get trained for some of those, fantastic. Um, and so what, what do I mean by that? Th these are uh, non-repetitive cognitive jobs that center around uh, design, engineering, teamwork, sales, creativity, uh, these are roles that you're going to have a persistent need for, um, for years and, and decades to come. And then you have this other set of opportunities, this human-centered uh, opportunity around, let's call it education and, and counseling and the rest of it, that you may have an interest in, but the resources may or may not be in place for uh, a whole additional rung of opportunities. And that, to me, is where the public sector should be playing a very robust role. Um, we've come of age in an era where the marketplace is supposed to figure it all out. Um, and in this instance, the marketplace is going to fail us on an epic, epic level. Because the marketplace may look and say, hey, this truck driver, instead of getting paid $50,000, now you're worth 25000 because you're not actually driving. The truck's driving itself, so you're just along for the ride. Uh, and so we're letting the market determine how much that trucker is worth. It could be 50000 it could be 25000 it could be zero. But the truck just doesn't need you. Uh, and so right now, that market measurement uh, is going to be very punitive to a whole set of people. And then the question is, how do you actually create intrinsic value for people that's independent of the market or end up creating a market for the work of the future that you need. That is why I ran for president, in a nutshell, uh, is that I thought that we needed to, one, start recognizing intrinsic human value through something like a universal basic income, and two, that there has to be a massive investment in these jobs of the future throughout the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, unfortunately, again, the pandemic has accelerated many of the changes I was concerned about. We've seen 10 years worth of change in the last 10 weeks. Uh, and many of these changes are not great for many, many workers. You are right now in the midst, we are in the midst of the greatest calamity 
catastrophe in generations. So you're looking up thinking like, is this stuff normal? It's not normal. You know, like I'm a bit older than you. This is not normal. Uh, but this is where we are. And so you have tens of millions of jobs gone. They're gone for good. 42% of the jobs lost during this crisis are not returning. Uh, so this is not like a rubber band where it's going to somehow snap back into place. So we have a hole of around 17 million jobs that we need to fill uh, and we need to get to work doing it a, 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 as quickly as possible. So you talk about the future of work in many ways, we have to come together and determine what that future looks like. Uh, this is something that to me, government must lead in. Certainly universities can play a huge role. It's one reason why I'm very happy to address you all today. Uh, but this is the massive question of this time. What will the future of work be for you, for your friends, uh, for people both older and younger than you? Uh, and this is something that we need to answer. And in my book, I talk about the things that we value most in our lives. Um, and many of these things are not really rewarded uh, economically. And so I, I'm going to just throw out something, I, you know, I think it's true for you because it's been true for most kids. So there are these things that you enjoy doing, um, but then there's like this pressure, sometimes from your parents, sometimes from others, where it's like, but that stuff's not really uh, what you want to what you want to study or get trained for, because on this one hand, you have things that you enjoy. Let's call it writing, creativity, uh, art, um, sports, social stuff, uh, things that might be the center of like a club that you're a member of. And then you have the stuff that's supposed to be like work related. And one of like the features of this work related stuff is that it's no fun. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like you look up and you're like, oh, like, I, I guess I'm going to study um, whatever the most practical thing is because like, like that's how you get a quote unquote real job. Uh, and that is, uh, th that, that is the marketplace in action. Uh, and when you talk about what this fourth industrial revolution means for humanity, it's about trying to redefine why we do what we do, how we value it, uh, and saying to folks that these things that you enjoyed, you enjoy and you're, you're young now, so you probably still enjoy these things in a way that, that um, many of us uh, still like, you know, look back on fondly, um, that these things can become the center of a new economy, but it will never happen uh, on its own. Uh, the market will not somehow start to value creativity and helping people uh, and, and other things that you enjoy at a high enough level um, for it to become the economy of the future unless we come together collectively and make those determinations right now. That my mission is to humanize our economy, humanize work, uh, and the big challenge here is that the market actually is heading the other direction very, very quickly. The market does not want to reward these things. It's not rewarding them now. I mean, if you look at it, if, if you were a musician right now and you went to your folks and said, hey, I'm going to become a you know, professional musician, like very, very few of your parents would jump for joy. They'd be like, oh, my gosh, my kid is just about to embark on this um, impossible dream or something like that. And that's now. And that's before some of these trends get much, much worse so, so we have to do everything we can to reinvigorate the humanity in our economy and our opportunities. And it really is going to fall on your generation, but it needs to be done for your generation too, because you're going to be emerging from school into this, uh, into this landscape. And what you do is going to define our future. So when you ask me about what the future of work is, um, what I would say is that we have to make the future of work something that you want, something that we want, and that this is going to be a human process, a political process, and I know that does not is not appealing to, to some of you, but that's just the reality, uh, because in this instance, the market will not help us. The market actually is going to try and do more with fewer and fewer of us over time. So I hope that this has been a uh, call to action, uh, a bit of a, a sense of both the present and the future. 
And I, I will say too, again, that you all are going to be in great shape relative to many, many other people because you're here right now, you're studying, you're equipping yourself with uh, skills and training uh, in things that you care about, yes, but are also going to be relevant. Uh, and you're still learning and growing and changing in a way that many of us can only look back fondly on. So thank you all for having me today. Thank you, Channel Pacific University, and let's make the future what we want it to be. Thank you all so much. Now we move on to the panel discussion in response to Andrew Yang's keynote address. Let me introduce you to our dynamic panel. First, we have Dr. Owen Ewald, C. May Marston, Associate Professor of Classical Languages and Civilizations at Seattle Pacific University. Next, we have Dr. Narazzo Vududu, Dean of the School of Education here at Seattle Pacific University. Next, we have Michael Schaffsma, Assistant Vice President for Information Technology. And last on the panel, we have Dr. Carlos Arias, Assistant Professor and the Chair of Computer Science here at Seattle Pacific University. In addition, I want to introduce you to our smart panel of students who are here to engage with us as we respond to the Andrew Yang keynote address. We're excited to have an intrepid group of students join us today on Zoom. I am going to take the time to introduce you to each of them so they can share their academic area with you. First, we have John Amerding. Hello, I'm John. I'm a Master of Arts in Teaching student in the One Year Accelerated Program. And I thought the Andrew Yang keynote speech was very thought provoking. Thank you. Next, we have Carissa Cox. I'm a senior business administration and honors liberal arts double major. Um, and the Andrew Yang keynote address certainly made me feel apprehensive about the changes of the fourth industrial revolution, but also like there's a lot of unforeseen opportunity. Next, we have Natasha Koval. Hi there, um, I'm a senior and I'm double majoring in economics and honors liberal arts. Um, and as an economics major, I feel really empowered by Andrew's keynote address. Um, I'm excited to go do something real in the world. Next, we have Stephen Katanksky. I'm a junior double majoring in economics and politics, philosophy, and economics. And Andrew Yang's address uh, made me realize how important it is during this time of rapid technological change that we uh, treat all the change ethically and make sure that we're moving down the right path. Next, we have Karsten Kraining. Um, I'm Karsten Kraining. I am a sophomore business administration and honors liberal arts. And the Andrew Yang speech um, made me feel inspired that we still have a lot to work on, even though it could be tough in the future, but yeah. Next, we have Taylor Marshall. Hi there, I'm a first year PhD student in the education department, and I thought the Andrew Yang keynote speech was really eye-opening, and I think that it's a very important thing to talk about with um, young people going to school. Next, we have AJ Patel. Hi, I'm AJ. I'm double majoring in economics and political science, philosophy, and economics. And um, the one thing um, I would describe the Andrew Yang talk with is uh, the word captivating, just because with this rapid change in technology and in our industries, um, it's really important that we grasp together as a society the fact that we need to get control of it before it gets control of us. Next, we have Katie Taggart. 
Hi, I'm Katie. I am a sophomore double majoring in apparel design and apparel merchandising. I'm also working on double minoring in history and costume production, respectively. After watching the keynote address from Andrew Yang, I really, it just occurred to me that there are going to be a lot of changes, both currently and coming changes that we're going to have to adapt to, especially in the retail industry, which is kind of what I'm basing my future around, but it will just be interesting to see how it all plays out. And next, we have Cody Weed. Hi, I'm a first year PhD student in the education department. Uh, after watching Andrew Yang's um, uh, speech, um, it was captivating and it's a very necessary conversation. Um, and we really, really need human personal relationships. Um, and as, a, uh, as someone who works in a middle school, uh, we can't have AI take over com completely. Uh, we need those human personal relationships. Thank you. Next, we're going to move into our question and answer session. This is where I call on the students to ask either specific panelists or just throw out a question for the panelists on what they wanted to know in response to the Andrew Yang video. They have a lot of curiosities and we think this panel is up to the task. So let's get going. I was really intrigued by some of the points Andrew Yang made about the future of work in his keynote address. So now I'm going to invite each of our panelists to share their reflection on what they thought about the keynote address. First, I'm going to call on Dr. Owen Ewald to give us his initial reflections. Thank you, Radeen. What I appreciated most about Mr. Yang's talk was that he focused on shifting our mindset about work more than about the nuts and bolts of how we might pay for universal basic income. We really need to unlearn a lot of bad ideas about work, especially how we are equivalent to our jobs. Hmm. I think about that rude question people sometimes used to ask during the 1970s, what do you do? Which was not so much about what you actually did for a living as about what your status was in society. Also, no one expected the answer, I enjoy sunrises, or I make dad jokes to annoy my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> what I want to add to this discussion is that we have been here before. There have been numerous times in human history where work has shrunk or disappeared, and we can learn um, from the individual and systemic choices of others. One big choice from Roman history, which I study, you want um, whether the, you choose the road or the fish tank. Roman roads were some of the most successful construction projects in history, and many Roman roads have now been shored up and paved over to become highways in modern Europe. Roads benefited almost everyone, directly or indirectly, not just in terms of the supply chain of goods and labor, but also allowed people to visit their friends and relatives in other towns. Roman fish tanks were not the tiny plastic boxes of today, but closer in size to swimming pools. They were a popular status symbol among the Roman super rich, and they were stocked with exotic species and, min and maintained by enslaved staff. These tanks needed enormous amounts of money to, um, to build them and maintain them, yet they benefited only their owners and their elite guests. These were not public aquariums, but more like a giant big screen TV in a basement. Obviously, you could not stop extremely wealthy people from spending money on fish tanks or swimming pools or yachts. But you can tax them enough so that they might dial down their fish tank type consumption. They might forego a larger or second yacht for themselves so that the local government has enough money to build and maintain roads for everyone. In other words, I agree with Mr. Yang that we need to reframe the goals of an economy. The goal is not for everyone to practice fish tank type consumption, since that's mathematically impossible. Rather, the goal should be for everyone to have access to road type amenities, whether that means literal roads, public transportation, or the internet. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ewald. Next, I'm going to invite Dr. Vududu to share her reflections on Andrew Yang's talk. Thank you, Radine. Um, my initial reaction was, oh man, <laughs> <laughs> this is overwhelming. There's a lot of paradigm shifting that has to happen. 
And then I kind of took a step back to look at what is it that a person can do in their little area? Because if we look at the bigger picture, it just seemed way too overwhelming and just a lot to take in. That's my initial reaction. Fear <laughs> and trepidation. <laughs> OK, thank you. Next, I'm going to invite Michael Schaffsma to share his reflection on Andrew Yang's keynote address. Thanks, Rudine. Um, Yang's keynote address very much mirrors his book. I, I first became aware of him during the presidential campaigns. And wow, I was like, this is a candidate who's actually talking about something that no one is talking about and something that is fundamentally altering our society fundamentally altering who we are, our economies, our jobs, our future, the direction our country is heading. And he reflected that also in his talk today. Um, it's really important to begin thinking about these issues because if we don't understand them and pay attention to them, we can't shape them. And if we can't shape them, then the future will shape us and we might not like where we're going. We have a tremendous opportunity here to rethink where our country is going, where our economy is going, possibly bringing about even a new renaissance. Okay, thank you, Michael. Next, we're going to invite Dr. Arias to share his reflection on Andrew Yang's keynote address. Well, as a matter of fact, just like my colleague Nandarso was saying, I was also kind of uh, scared in the beginning. It was like, oh my God, where are we going? Um, Micah just said a very beautiful word, Renaissance. My second thing that I thought was like Greek culture. You know, if AI and technology takes over all this menial work, then maybe we're going to have more time for art culture, philosophy, yeah. science, maybe even thinking be closer to our God. And then it became more complicated when he started to talk about the economy. <laughs> well, <laughs> definitely it's going to be a new world. Uh, fortunately, we humans have a superpower. We adapt. And it would be great if our governments not just the U.S., I come from another part in, uh, of the continent, and if the people that lead us actually foresee the stuff that is happening and that can start adapting our society to, like Micah was saying, let us preemptively prepare for this. Well, it seems like they're not doing it, so maybe universities, we have a lot of brain power. So we may be able to help our students and maybe even society. So I am very hopeful that we can do that. And in the end, like we're saying in these times of pandemic, we are in it all together. Thank you, Dr. Arias. Now we're going to invite our students to ask the panel questions that they had based on their viewing of the Andrew Yang keynote address. Okay, our first question comes in from Carissa Cox, and she has a question about the future of education. Carissa. Hi, my question, I specifically for Dr. Bududu, but I'd love to hear from any of the panelists. Um, what is the role that higher education has to play in adapting to the changes of the fourth industrial revolution as Yang was referencing? Uh, he spoke about how these transformations that we're experiencing disproportionately affect Americans without a college degree. So as recipients of higher education, like we all are, how do we think about these challenges and use our curriculums to affect sustainable change for others in addition to ourselves? That's a good question. It's a big question. <laughs> I don't know that the role of um, education changes much. Um, I think how we do education changes. 
I think we're still, um, as educators, we're still preparing students to be effective members of society. We're still um, preparing students to contribute in meaningful ways, but how we do it may look different. So um, it used to be that the, the professor was the, um, had the information, right? They stood in front and gave you information, but with technology, that information is readily available. So what, how we do education changes in that we're trying to teach people how to be an accountant, how to be a statistician, how to be, how do you do that? What does a statistician do? So as opposed to giving you information about statistics or about accounting, we, it's more practical. And how does a statistician think? How does an accountant think? And how do you apply that uh, when you're out you know, fulfilling your, um, your discipline. So in that sense, we don't really uh, change the role. We just change how we do things. It's more practical versus more information giving. Anybody else can Any add to that? Want to add to this? Sure. Oh, oh, oh sorry. Go ahead, please. Uh, before we, <laughs> I, I don't think this is new. I think as educators, we've always been doing this. We've always been kind of adapting, and but the changes have been incremental. I think what is what is different is that what is being called for now is a bit more of a radical shift as opposed to the small changes that we've made as society has changed, as you know, as technology has changed, but this is a more radical shift. So I think that's where um, the jarring of, whoa, wait, what? <laughs> that's where that comes from. Um, and, we, and we have to think about that. And we have to, uh, and the change doesn't just come from the people providing the education, but from the people receiving it. Because there's a way that we've been trained that this is how education is done. And we need to change that in both the educatee and the educator as well. Michael? Yeah, I agree with that. It's not so much that higher education fundamentally changes, but how it's delivered changes. Um, that said, there's a tremendous role for higher education to play moving forward. Um, more and more a college degree, or what a college degree imparts on you with its co-curricular liberal arts education, it teaches you not how to, not just how to be an accountant, but how to, th how to think. Not what to think, how to think, how to learn, how to adapt. And it's that adaptability, um, that social interaction that you gain and understanding you gain in the collegiate environment that will make you more competitive outside. Now, your question also asked, how do we, or what is our role in kind of helping shape society? That's a really complicated question. Um, It will be college-educated people, by and large, who will help shape the future. You will have the ability to think, have the ability to ask these questions, and help refocus society in a different direction. And I really would love to dig into the economics, but I'll save that for a direct question on that, that area. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. I and thank like you for your add, question. Oh. I would like to add something that from the point of view of a computer scientist, um, there was a time when uh, education did not include computers or even calculators in high school. And then suddenly it was mandatory that everybody learned computers. Then it was internet. Everybody should learn how to use the internet. So this is a new technology that is in being incorporated in our lives, and we haven't talked in depth about it, okay? What is artificial intelligence? How is this going to affect us? How can I take advantage of it? So those kinds of discussions are going to be more now in the classroom than it were before because they are becoming a reality. So one thing that happens is that in higher education, my field, for instance, we're going to talk more about how to build inter artificial intelligence and how to make tools with it. But 
in general, in liberal arts education, like Micah was saying, it's about thinking. What does this mean to me? How can I use it? How is it affecting society? And, how, and what should I do to be part of the voices that are saying, this is affecting my world? And this is affecting the rest of the world. So it's critical thought. That is one of the most basic um, things that add value to a college education. OK, thank you. So piggybacking off of your mention of economics, I feel this is a great time to introduce AJ's question on data and privacy. And he has questions on new oil. So AJ, please share. Yeah, so data and privacy continue to play an increasing role in foreign relations and the topic of social media and, um, and, and particularly on foreign populations. So it's perhaps data the new oil in the coming future in terms of having political and economic leverage abroad? I'll start. So definitely this is a very very hard question because it has several perspectives to it and many ways to focus it i will attempt to say something from my own perspective and from my opinion and that is that definitely data is becoming very valuable in these times it is so valuable that Companies are giving us a lot of free services, free navigation service, free searching service, free social network service. But what is happening is that we're giving away data to them so that they can take advantage of it and monetize on it. What was the expression, Micah? When things are free, we become the product. Mm -hmm. So. Definitely, it's going there and data, it's going to bring power. But I believe that more than just data is about knowledge and how we're going to use it and take advantage of it. Yeah, to, to what Carlos said, if, uh, if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. <laughs> um, to understand this question, Internationally, you first have to understand it locally and how data is used, how corporations are leveraging it, what they're doing with it. The best examples are primarily with social, uh, social media. So your Facebook, your Twitter, your Snapchats. And when you start understanding what those platforms are actually doing, how they're tracking you, and how they're then taking that data and leveraging it and making money. So when you think, for instance, like Facebook, do you pay for it? No. But it's worth $20 billion. Why? How does it make money? How does it pay programmers hundreds of thousands of dollars a year? Same with Google. How do they generate revenue? And a lot of it comes back to ads, advertising, marketing, impressions, and alter, fundamentally altering your behavior. So when you start understanding that, then you think about behavior modification on an international scale, you start thinking about okay, well, how is that impacting elections? How is that impacting governments? How is that impacting social disorder in other countries? You can directly trace aspects of Arab, Arab Spring, you know, the revolts that happened in the Northern African nations and uh, Arab nations throughout the Middle East, directly back to some of this data. Um, you can look at what the US is right now doing in, uh, trying to ban TikTok and other applications because they're afraid that those applications are mining data, which they are, and then leveraging that back into China and China's using that. So there's lots of complexity and nuance here. Is data the new oil? Yes. Um, how it will be leveraged? That's a big question and it's really difficult to dig in and have a clear picture of how. Anyone else? Okay. All right. Okay. So next, 
We have a question from Taylor Marshall on the value of college degrees in this <laughs> time we're living in when we consider the future of work. Taylor? All right. So my question is, um, over the last several decades, more and more people have been obtaining college degrees um, probably to stand out and to, to gain skills that are really irreplaceable, like some of the skills and jobs that Andrew Yang was talking about becoming um, replaced by AI. So more and more people are getting uh, college degrees. And at the same time, jobs are requiring more and more requirements on their applications. So given all this, do you think that this is evidence of college degrees potentially losing their value? Um, kind of similar to like when too much money is printed and it loses its value. And if that's the case, what should we do as students and as future leaders to combat this? Okay, I'll take a stab at that. <laughs> um, I think this is where the um, value of a liberal arts education comes uh -huh. in, actually. Um, you heard as people were responding to various questions, um, like, from my perspective or from this perspective. And the value of a liberal arts um, college degree is that you get an opportunity to learn from different perspectives. You get to know how to think um, from different disciplines. Uh, and that, makes, that gives you those skills that are broader as opposed to uh, focusing on just your major. You know, it allows you exposure to other ways of thinking, other ways of understanding information, other ways of understanding our world. So you become more valuable because when there's a problem, you can think about it in a more comprehensive way as opposed to just uh, from your perspective. So I, I don't think, I think um, college will look different and what skills go into it and you get out of it, will we have to think about that about what skills do you want to get out of it so you can actually be effective and be the person that Andrew Yang was talking about. But I don't think that it will lose value. At least I hope it won't lose value. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll add on to that as well. Um, to your point on the liberal arts degree, having that variable uh, ability to adapt out in the job marketplace. Um, that's hugely important. And so when you start thinking about your question, rewind back to higher ed where it used to be. It was the primary method that empowered people to have social mobility, to change your economic outcome so that you could become, so you could move from basically being the son of, of or the daughter of someone who is at the lower end of the economic scale and raise up to something else move forward to where we are now, or maybe a few years ago, there could be a glut on the market of college degrees. So when you start thinking about the market supply and demand of labor, there are more college degrees out there than there are college degree jobs. So it's not necessarily the perspective of this institution, I'm just talking. Um, so of course, employers who didn't need to require college degrees started requiring them because college educated people by and large, perform better in the market, perform better in jobs and deliver more. I think that's about to change. There's going to be an inflection point. And so if you think about what Yang was saying, moving forward into the future, it might almost be a requirement to get any job to be college educated. I don't quite want to put it in that stark of terms, but what he's saying is the people who are going to shape the future, shape the economies, um, shape society are going to need to have deep understanding and a lot of skill. And so if anything, the value of a college degree is actually going to be increasing. I think it's the, um, that flexibility and being well-rounded. Yep. So in addition to having that college degree, what other skills do you have? And part of being in college is learning how to learn, you know, being um, I'm trying to translate what my father used to say. I think I've heard um, a professor here call it being editable. Mm. You know, are you are you able to?
to learn and grow and, and be, being in college trains your mind to be able to do that. So, so it's not just the degree, it's also those kind of skills that you can take anywhere and that's the additional piece that you can say, but I also have this other thing that I can do, I'm editable. I can, I can learn things because my mind has been trained in how to think and how to get information, be able to analyze it and use it. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to stay on this um, line of education just for a little bit more. Next, we have a question from John about teachers and wages and so forth. So I'll invite John to ask his question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so my question is, set against the backdrop of the fourth industrial revolution and considering the need for greater funding in education, how do we create a cultural shift placing a greater emphasis on higher wages for teachers, leading to prestige in the profession, better instruction and student outcomes, helping to move our country forward. Okay, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> that is an important question worldwide. <laughs> this is, um, in his book, um, Andrew Yang talks about all these education companies that are doing these wonderful things. And you, know, and you read about that in other, in, in other areas too. And um, what you see in these readings is like the, some common characteristics, right? That we have teachers that are highly qualified. Uh, we give them, we pay, compensate them well enough and we uh, give them freedom if they are qualified, we should trust them to know, you know, what they're doing, right? So, so you know, as I was reading, I'm seeing these three things, and it seems to me we know what we need to have effective schools, and that's what we should be doing, at, you know, that's what we should be doing in the public school system, because when we do that and have these private companies that are doing this, that's not, that's not access for everybody. You know, we kind of perpetuate these inequities because it's not everybody who has access to that. So, and this is more of a societal thing. I don't, I don't have an answer for you, but I feel with you <laughs> that this is something that really needs to be addressed if we're going to make any meaningful change. You know, because it's, it's unrealistic to expect that teachers can keep doing what they're doing on what they're paid. Um, as you know, being in education, you know a lot of teachers use their own resources to provide for their students to, so they can do an effective job. And that's just, that's just criminal, that's just wrong. And it's, uh, do we value that as society? And I don't, I don't have an answer, but when you go to lobby, I'm coming with you. <laughs> that is, exactly what I was thinking that it's about the people who are making the decisions and it turns out that it goes back to the government. People making laws, the make, uh, people deciding budgets and it returns to the population in general. So as a whole population and Nadarso said something very important what do we value? Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I have been thinking about why is education suddenly being so poor in comparison as when I was a high school student and when my parents were a high school student. So what has been happening? And it seems like the whole society is trying to have it easier because they don't want to argue, it seems. So it's something like deeper. So on one side is that population and the other side is political will to make the change that is good for us, but not necessarily popular for us. So like she was saying, you want to lobby this? I will have a little flag saying, go for it. Because I believe that education is the center of a healthy democracy. But if we say, you know, we want to move the country forward, we can't, 
we can't move a country or any society forward when we're leaving a whole group of people behind. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't, it just doesn't work. It's just, it's just math. That's not going to work. <laughs> so if we say we value that and we do want to move forward, then we have to seriously think about working within the system to change it and not trying to address some of those issues outside the system, which is what, and I, you know, and I understand that people are resorting to that because they feel like the system is failing them. So we have these private educational, um, you know, companies and, and no slam on them, you know, I'm just saying going outside the system to try and fix it is not going to work. I was going to use an analogy that may be inappropriate, so I won't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I want to hit the economic aspect of this. So part of the challenge, I think, in paying teachers has always been from, from an economic value perspective, how do you measure it? If I'm flipping burgers or doing some other tangible work, I can look and say that work yielded that outcome, that economic value. The economic value that teachers put into society is often not realized for years to decades. And so there's been a mismatch on how valuable they actually are to society. In the US in general, our time horizon is too short. We think in years, possibly decades. We need to be thinking in decades and centuries. When we start thinking longer term, all of a sudden it doesn't make sense to pay teachers less. We realize that the fabric of our society and our democracy is based foundationally in what's delivered there. And we don't realize that right now because we're not looking far enough down the road. We need to be thinking long term. Because I guarantee you, other countries are thinking longer term than we are, and they're playing the long game and we're playing the short game. They realize this, and they're investing in these spaces where we have been pulling back, and it's a huge mistake. Okay, so I want to take a moment to shift. I want to take a little shift here in regards to some of the questions the students have. Seattle Pacific University is a Christian liberal arts university. And some of our students have some questions about our role as an institution and just the human aspect of what we're seeing in regards to AI and the future of work. Now we have a couple great questions here, so I may call on a couple of students to read their questions, but I just want to give that general idea of some of the thoughts they have in regards to what can we do? How, how can we lead the way? How can we model thoughts around what it means to be human and what we can do as a faith institution to address some of the changes we're seeing? Okay, so now I have a question. We have a historical context question and one from Natasha. I'll start with Natasha. Natasha, can you share your question? Yeah, um, so I think it's incredibly common that we're talking about um, why we're working, how we're working in the output of work. Um, but I'm really curious what everybody's thoughts are on rest and work-life balance. Um, as Dr. Copeland was saying, SPU is a faith-based institution. And as a part of the Christian faith, the idea of Sabbath, um, I think shouldn't be an unfamiliar one to us. Um, but I think it's really evident that burnout and exhaustion are really common in a lot of industries around the world. Um, and Mr. Yang was talking about in his keynote address, um, this idea of humanizing work. Um, so how does everybody think that the fourth industrial uh, revolution and um, the future of work itself, how is that gonna play into this idea of rest and work-life balance? Sure, I'll, hap I'll happily address that one. I mean, I think the idea of Sabbath is really important. I mean, just because, you know, we're, um, we're not machines, you know, and let's see, mm -hmm. then the Hebrew Bible recognized that, okay? Um, I think that we will, that we could even use, to some extent, technology to build in Sabbaths. Um, for instance, French companies have a rule that, um, that people cannot send email past 6 p.m. Mm. And I think something like that um, might be 
a good start towards moving towards a better work-life balance so that people can um, enjoy time with their families, have family dinner together, uh, things like that. Um, I would, I might even um, welcome a time on Sunday, our Sabbath, say when Canvas was shut off on campus, you know, just to, um, to ensure that people do something other than <laughs> look at a screen. Um, again, that's, that's more of my particular take, but I, but I think um, you know, we've got to respect the day, respect the week, and respect our bodies and souls. Thank you. You know, it's interesting that you said that, Owen, because um, B&H Photo, which is a, a photo and technology company, they sell cameras and things out of New York, which is a Jewish-run company. They actually shut down their website and don't sell anything on, on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. I'd like to add another thing that <sighs> there are several concepts that may change the times. One of them may be work. Um, our society values money, values how much we can make. And people tend to go and work their life off because they value that more than the time that they can spend with their families or with other leisure activities. I particularly love to work. And I have found <laughs> out <laughs> that if I am not working, I get sad. I have to be doing it. Too long vacations, bad for my health. That's my case. And um, sometimes I, I see the possible world that robots and AI can bring and in which I won't have to work as hard, or maybe I will going to have more time. And since you brought up that we are in a faith-based institution, <laughs> it kind of uh, trigger a memory from the fiddler on the roof. You know, Tevye keeps singing, if I was a rich man. <laughs> so if we get the AI to take care of a lot of this stuff, we will have much more time to study the Bible because he said, I will have more time to be in the temple talking with the rabbi and that will be the sweetest thing of all. So in his value scale, to have the opportunity to explore his faith was more valuable than the big house in the middle of the town with the geese and ducks and all that and the double chin wife. <laughs> so it's like, it can change. So it's where do we place our values? Where is our heart in? That's, I think, the question. Thank you. And just a slight segue, but continuation of what we're talking about in regards to how can we model what it means to be human and what does it mean to be a faith-based institution? We have some two questions I have here. Um, one I'm gonna go with, Carsten. Carsten has a question around how do we like band together as humans? I would let him lead the way on his question. Um, okay, so according to Mr. Yang's speech, he believes we as a society need to band together to reshape our economy to be more empathetic. Our society, however, is more divided um, than ever than right now. And millions of Americans losing their jobs likely will not bring it any closer. What shift needs to happen in our culture to allow for an, an economically sustainable society in the wake of this forthcoming industrial revolution? Um, to something I said earlier, we need to be thinking longer term we need to not think about cutting down trees and, and all the different ways that we're leveraging natural resources to create short-term economic value and think long-term. It's not that we shouldn't use trees to build buildings and, and whatnot, but we need to be thinking beyond the initial stock bump and what I'm going to hit by the end of the quarter. It's really funny because a lot of companies uh, rush so fast to hit end of quarter that they give away their product. And you're like, gosh, if they just didn't do that, I would have to pay full price later. But mm -hmm. when fiscal year end comes, you get 20% off. And that's kind of silly because they're, they're looking for those short-term 
gains, not long term. Long term, it would be economically better for them to wait, but they're trying to appease a shareholder. Which brings you into a concept that some of you in the business school know as the, share, or the stakeholder paradox. It's the fact that you've got a lot of players that you're addressing as an organization, right? You've got the shareholders who own the organization, but you've got the government, you've got your employees, you've got the customers. And to serve any one of those any better, you have to ignore the rest. So to give customers more, I have to give shareholders less. Right now, the winner always seems to be the shareholder. And the winner needs to start becoming society. We need to start thinking broader than just individual organizations and the role that those organizations play in the broader economy in this country and worldwide. That leads to another thing that was triggered by your questions. When I was analyzing and all the questions that you have said so far, to my mind, it comes the following phrase, values engineering, re-engineering. We need to rethink about what we value. And like Micah was saying, we need to invest it in the newer generations because this is not a change that happens in 5, 10, or even 20 years. This happens in the long run. And for society to change the whole way that they see things, it takes time. So I, I just wanted to share that values re-engineering. It's not just education, it's not just about techniques, it's about moving into a more human society. And for that, we as a society need to think, uh, think differently. Teaching during a pandemic, I taught uh, classes, let's see, in winter when we had to rapidly transform to an online model, and then in spring when we were faced with an onslaught of socio-political disruption in society. I must admit that I, I was really humbled by the strength of our students. They asked us tough questions. They were fully engaged. They were activists, and it really made us realize as professors that our students, they're leading the way. They're calling on us to set examples. They're calling on us to lean in to the issues that are going on in society. And if we don't, they hold us accountable. So the next question is an example of questions that we receive as professors in the classroom that sometimes we may not always know the answer for because they're big questions but I wanted to give the opportunity to Stephen to ask one of these hard questions and put it towards the panel to answer. Stephen, go ahead. Andrew Ng talked about how we can think about shaping our society and how artificial intelligence will play a crucial role in that process. Um, but every artificial intelligence is only as good as the input that you give it. Um, so my question is, given the pervasiveness of systemic anti-Black racism in our country, how can we ensure that artificial intelligence doesn't just perpetuate our human prejudices? That is a wonderful question. Mm -hmm. And I, I honestly also been thinking about it. Um, you know, AI is going to work as good as the data we feed it. If we feed it, one million pictures of cats and two pictures of dogs, then it's not going to be very good at identifying dogs. And I believe that one way is that we went, there are two, two, two aspects of this. One is the people who build the AI. So on that side, we need to sensibilize AI developers so that they know that these things happen that they know that the data is inherently biased because it comes from us that we are also biased. So they need to take that into consideration when they are building it so that it is easily maintainable and modifiable, okay? So that it can support evolution as, uh, as they are figuring out that this product in specific might have a little bias here. So 
That's one way. The other thing is that as users, we also need, or like supervisor, may, uh, <laughs> better said, we need to know that we need to be on top of the AI. There will, we need, we still need to be the human in the loop, not outside, not like, okay, the AI said that I should reject the credit, so no credit for Mr. John Smith. No, there should be a human that checks and rechecks and says, oh no, this was a biased decision. Okay, so there should always be involvement of the wisdom of a human with AI. Because we know that the bias is going to exist. So we need to keep um, involved as humans in it. That's absolutely right, Carlos. Um, I'll give you two examples of hundreds of examples. Um, you, you brought up loans. Uh, insurance is, is another one. But two that, that I have seen or been aware of, one of them was when Google Translate first came out. And some, some folks who were researching, like, is Google Translate really translating correctly? Is it imparting bias? Started playing around with it. And they noticed that whenever you said a phrase like, she's a great doctor, and you translate it into another language, and you translate it back, it would always come back as, he is a great doctor. Because based on language, so for those of you who are familiar with Project Gutenberg, Google went through and scanned all the books that they could get their hands on. Practically every book known to man scanned it in, pointed AI at it, and said, learn. Learn language. They didn't teach it how to get between French and English. It just learned how to do it. But in doing so, it imparted historical bias. And clearly, based on backwards history, women can't be doctors, which is crazy. And so the AI is perpetuating historical bias. Now, when you're inventing something like Google Translate and you're sitting there hacking in your room thinking, OK, cool, I'm going to teach it how to do this, it requires conscious effort to think that. right? You have to know that that's a possibility, and you have to account for it. Uh, a more recent mistake, 2016, uh, Microsoft released a millennial chatbot named Tay. Uh, it was supposed to engage with millennials and talk to them online, be quippy. In 24 hours, it was spouting Nazi propaganda. Mm. Um, and they had to take it down. I don't think it ever occurred to any of the people building it that it would ever do that. But then again, they never told it not to. And they <laughs> pointed it at information that's led it astray. So we have to be incredibly conscious and pay, basically be very mindful when we start building out these technologies, understanding what their power is and what their limitations is what their limitations are. Yeah. So this, uh, I also had this question, actually, as I was, um, you know, reading the book and uh, listening to the talk. Um, I mean, one could argue that it's a computer. It doesn't have bio. It's colorblind, right? <laughs> so that's an argument that you could make, that it's colorblind. It's not going to be biased, and it's just going to be fair. Um, and that, that may, may be true, but the thing is, people have uh, these nuances. You know, part of our identity is all these differences. And by ignoring those differences, then you don't really get to know the needs of the person, you know, or how to deal with some of those nuances. So I don't know that it's a good thing to, be, to have AI be colorblind. It sounds nice. Just like when people say they are colorblind, it sounds nice, but yeah, you should be able to see me and see everything that comes with who I am so you can address it and not bring those biases in because that's how you can perpetuate those biases like you were talking about, yeah. Micah. If it's already in the system, it's already there, and you don't intentionally reverse it, then it's going to, it's going to keep uh, going on. Um, when you were talking about examples, I thought, I think of myself as a reasonably um, intelligent person, uh, but I was having a difficult time in the bathroom getting the water to come out so I could wash my hands. And I, so I thought, you know, I, I stood there for a while and watched people to see if I was doing something wrong. 
And no, I was doing what they were doing. Mm. It didn't recognize me because it didn't recognize dark skinned. Oh, wow. So mm. it was not, the water was not coming out. Yep. So to, what, to your point, Carlos, about who programs these things, if, if there's no intentionality in that programming, then we can perpetuate this same thing. And it's, it may not be intentional, it's just that's who is there. Mm -hmm. So we have to think about who is there, who is, you know, who is excluded, so we can make sure that those pieces are programmed into whatever it is that we're doing. That, that's a characteristic of the scien scien scientist, okay? Sometimes we go into a room, like Micah was saying, and we go to hack it, Okay, and we get into this, into the zone. And all we care is input, output, does it work? How reliable it is? Does it have good precision, recall, and we see the numbers and everything, and it, it goes, and then I don't care. I just feel satisfied that this is working as it should. Now here is where it comes, the value of a liberal arts education. Okay, in this university, we have computer science but our students are exposed to these issues. So they can bring up this intentionality. Um, perhaps if they were not exposed, and there is no malice in it, it will be just like, I just want the code to run. It runs, it works, I get paid. But now it's, it runs, it works, is it working fairly? So they, they consider this thing because at least we try to seed this thought into their heads. And with time, it will bring a flower and maybe we will see it change in the future. So what struck me in our conversation is that we're talking a lot about the college level students, grad school level students, and ourselves as adults. But bias, when does it start, right? It's this subconscious. And oftentimes, it is intentionally conscious, socialization and society. Right. In my field, we often talk about the role of the family, the role of society. And really and truly, some of my more advanced students in regards to sociocultural awareness and so forth. Some of them did get to travel, but what I was really struck by with a lot of them is how they were raised. When I, and it, it didn't matter the color of their skin, and there was a level of intentionality in their homes, in the, the elementary school education they got, right? In their teachers, there, there was a level of intentionality at those stages that they can communicate in their papers or communicate in their sharings um, in class sessions that made me realize like, oh, this is why you're so advanced, right? So I think this is a good segue into Cody's question about AI and the K-12 education. So I'm going to invite Cody to share his question. Yeah, thank you for taking my question. the economy and right now it's going in the opposite direction with AI becoming more prevalent every single year does K through 12 education need a change to help support intrinsic human value if yes how thank you okay, I think before we focus on what needs to change we need to to kind of think about you know honestly evaluate if we're living up to the ideals of you know of of k-12 education i don't know that we've changed from wanting to um you know have a democracy having uh, a citizenry that can participate in a democracy or having um students learn you know learn about character and morality uh, or having education be the great equalizer. I think I can get behind those values. <laughs> and those have been there for, you know, for some time. But is, have we been living up to those? So I think we need to, before we, we um, have a conversation about what needs to change, we need to look at what do we have right now and how well are we doing it? And 
if we're not doing it well, then maybe it's in how we do things, not so much in changing our, you know, our, our views, our values. But if it is our values, then yeah, we can have that conversation. Um, I mean, the, the opportunity gap has been there for a long time and it persists. So it seems like the issue is, uh, at least the way I see it, the issue um, partly is in who has the opportunities to get access to those values that we have. Um, not so much do we need to change the values. We need, of course, we need to adapt and change. And as things change, we need to adapt what they are. But I think they fundamentally, they remain the same. But how we do things um, and how we value people. So going back to that uh, human value is going to uh, impact how we actually deal with the kids that walk into our classrooms, in our K-12 classrooms. Do we look at the strengths that they bring as strengths? They may be different from what we think of as strengths because of the way we were socialized and our experiences. But if we don't see what they bring as something that is of value, then we might miss the opportunity to connect that to what we actually want them to learn. Um, but, oh, oh, go ahead, please. Uh, I just looked at my notes and thought of, uh, <laughs> I think a lot is put on the K-12 system, but I, I think, you know, the K-12 system is a microcosm of society. And it's also in society, what do we value? Do we, do we value humans in the same way? Do we value those differences? Do we see differences as just different or do we put a hierarchy to them? Thanks, Naradzo. Um, I'll address a different aspect of your question, I think, and, and the role that artificial intelligence might play in the K-12 K through 12 space. So the administration efficiencies aside, if we're looking at the classroom, I'm reminded of a quote from David Lassner, who's the president of the University of Hawaii system, and was at a talk that he was giving, and he recalled a session he was talking to faculty about artificial intelligence, and, and a faculty member spouted back like, are you trying to replace us? And he said, well, if, if what you can do can be replaced by a computer, then I can and should do that. I hope that you provide a lot more value. Mm -hmm. So I don't see AI coming into K through 12 or higher ed for that matter and replacing what we do. It will augment what we do. Yeah. And in the K through 12 space, I think the opportunity that we have is to nuance and tailor education directly to each individual student and their learning styles in ways that no individual teacher could do, right? Some, some learn better by reading, some are visual learners, some are auditory learners. So we can more directly address individual students and their needs, but I don't think we're ever gonna replace teachers. The role that a teacher plays in the human formation of a student, a computer can't do that. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the system is doing a good job for who it was designed to serve. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. so, so it's, it's doing good at that. But to your point, um, Micah, teaching is about relationships. Mm -hmm. We can certainly use um, um, technology to gather information. We can probably gather a lot more information than, you know, a human can. But that's not the same thing. I think Yang says this in his book that um, content is not the same as education, mm -hmm. right? So at the, at the core of it, teaching and education is about those relationships and there's just no way you can get those nuances, those, each relationship is different. A teacher might teach a class of students, but you're really teaching individuals. Mm -hmm. You have a group of students in that room, but you're really teaching individuals and there's just, I just don't see how um, any, I don't care how advanced it is, how artificial intelligence can get at that. But it can certainly make, uh, you know, take some of the tasks over, like getting content to students, but it can't have those relationships that, that connection that makes a student go, oh, that's what you mean when you're talking about variance. 
because everybody talks about variance. I'll, I'll add one thing to that, and it's just an, a, another example, of probably a tangible example of how this could be used. So I'm thinking of a talk that I heard a while back from the superintendent of, I believe it was the Renton Schools, and she noted that within the Renton School District as a whole, there were 140 different languages spoken by the students. How on earth can teachers meet that need? Mm -hmm. It's nigh impossible. They try anyway. Um, I could see where we can use artificial intelligence and real-time translation in the classroom to break down language barriers and increase accessibility to students. Um. Very quickly, and just re-saying something that I said before. Um, you were saying that how do we tell the students in K-12 about the intrinsic human value. And maybe we just need to re-remember it and make it foreground in the conversation. That is not just about learn this equation, solve this problem, get this grade but also about putting emphasis in the relationships and what it means, what, 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 what you are, <laughs> how you intrinsically are valuable. Not because you get straight A's, <laughs> not because you're the fastest athlete, but because intrinsically you are of value. So sometimes we tend to forget in, in, in all these contents and, and, and check marks that we don't do to go back to the basics. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. okay, so as we come close to the end of our panel discussion, but not quite the end, I want to bring it to jobs and the industry. So we have one student left with a question and Katie has a really, really good question that really ties into what Andrew Yang is talking about in his book, The War on Normal People. So he addresses a lot the fact that there are certain roles in society where AI is going to take over, right? And, and what does that mean? So for students getting their college degrees and they're thinking of their parents and they're thinking about like what what would the industries look like in the next 10 years katie has a question on that and that would be um our last question to the session and the panel feel free to engage katie hi thanks for that lovely introduction dr copeland so mr yang in his keynote address mentioned that many schools are currently preparing students for an industrial world that's quickly disappearing how is SPU specifically preparing the students for the fourth industrial revolution and their respective careers in this new context Furthermore, in your opinions, what do you think that some of the industries and or jobs that our students might be entering are uh, some of the students that are some of the jobs that our students are entering are the ones that Mr. Yang listed as being most affected by the fourth industrial revolution, such as brick and mortar retail and manufacturing, things like that. Um, my whole future, you know. <laughs> so what do you think that these industries will look like in 10 years? I'll actually. Um... I'll say that there are real challenges that um, Mr. Yang identified, especially in the trucking industry and in manu manufacturing. Um, let's see, where there might be self-driving trucks displacing three million people, okay, or different kinds of manufacturing. Um, let's see, where a robots and AI will do some of the work. Interestingly, in manufacturing now, um, the majority of workers have college degrees. Hmm. So, I look at it in a way it'll be, I'd say, more high-tech, smarter manufacturing. Okay? And I'll also say, you know, with, um, without much background in economics, that I think brick-and-mortar retail will still have very much a place, or that there will still be people um, who need the kind of assistance and even relationship and dialogue um, that a brick-and-mortar establishment can provide. My daughter used to work at a drugstore, and there were definitely people um, who could have bought um, their cosmetics over the internet, but needed someone to talk with about their choices and needed, um, I'd say, human interaction around that transaction. So not just a transaction, but an interaction. Um, and, I'll also, and I'll also say that to, uh, in the economies of the future, something like 
um, seven different jobs or seven different careers even might be sort of more the norm than the exception. So um, the liberal arts background that you get from SPU or so colleges like it, um, whether you majored in computer science, in English, in fashion, uh, in education, will prepare you for how to think and how to adapt to whatever comes along. Thank you. Um, go, go ahead. I can tell one thing that SPU specifically is doing for our students. The day of common learning. <laughs> the days of common All learning. Right. The week of common learning. And this is going to be recorded so everybody can come and see it again. We are having the conversations. We got awareness. This is happening and we're starting our conversation. Owen said it beautifully. Not ma doesn't matter what major you're in. Your professors are going to touch base at some point about it. Particularly in computer science, we are talking about the ethics and AI, and we're having AI cores being incorporated into our curriculum. So we're, we're also trying to adapt, to go with the changes, okay? And this is the kind of event we have been always open. Well, I've been here only four years, so since I've been here, this institution has always been open these conversations. Thanks, Carlos. That's absolutely right. I mean, the whole purpose of having this conversation as part of the day of common learning is about moving this forward. I don't think any institution has solved this yet. There are some who are, who are innovative in this space, trying to figure out what does this look like? What do the jobs of the future look like? How do we pivot our programs uh, to, to incorporate aspects of this, like for instance, aspects of social media into our majors and our degrees so we understand the role that those are playing in our society. And we have been offering those classes. Uh, Dr. Adrian Copeland has actually taught some of those here. We are just at the beginning of trying to figure this out though. To your, to your question though on, is my job relevant when I graduate? Um, yeah, your liberal arts education has taught you how to think, has taught you how to learn, has taught you how to adapt, whether or not you're looking at the retail space. And to Owen's point, retail's not necessarily going away. People always want that human connection. I, I will buy a lot of stuff on Amazon. I won't buy everything on Amazon. Uh, there's lots of things that I want to go talk to an actual human being. I want to try in the clothes before I buy them to see that they fit. I don't like this whole model where you ship me a pair of shoes and they don't work and I have to send them back and eight days later I get another pair. So there's always room for that. The stuff that is repetitive, so Yang talks a little bit about uh, truck driving. That's a whole different can of worms. Stuff that is repeatable is automatable. Stuff that does not require human interaction, relationship, or complex thought and innovation is also automatable. And so we need to be thinking about those, how we train people into them, so that we're training them to adapt as those industries morph and change and grow. There was one question that we didn't answer fully, which was, what do you do if your job is displaced by this? And I think an important thing to realize is, jobs are always found when some are displaced. So we can think back, and Owen can speak in great detail historically, around jobs that have gone away. I mean, we don't have chariot makers anymore, we don't have switchboard operators anymore. It's not like um, you know, when those jobs went away, those people did nothing. They moved on to do different things. And so part of the education that you get here and that adaptability helps you live into that and also find new work and new ways of employing the skills that you already learned. Well, thank you, panelists. Thank you, students. This brings us to the end of our 2020 Days of Common Learning. This is our 19th day of Common Learning. Just this year, we expanded it to an entire week. We thought the moment was too large to just use one day. So we really hope that you joined us throughout the week and you found something that really got you on the path of thinking about what it means to live and evolve in the future of work. AI is here 
And we have to think about what it means to be human. It ha we have to think about how do we live with our neighbors? How do we think through education? How do we think about sociopolitical issues? Each of us is here to make a change. I just want to thank you for joining us from all around the world. I want to thank all our panelists during the week who came from various institutions, came from various corporations, to lend insight into this large topic, the future of work. Thank you and know that Seattle Pacific University is committed to engaging on these social issues every single year, 19 years and counting. We hope you join us next year and thank you.